So we'll get started because we know we have 12 families here right now and um, it's we always learn so much from your sessions. Hi, Gabby. Gabby's here every session every day. Um, we're so glad that you're here with us and integrating and we're part of your learning day. It's part of our learning day too. Um, this is a topic we haven't done very much about about light, right? We're doing visible light. Um, sure. And we know we've done some investigations with our astrophysicist, Lori, about light and what it means, um, a light year, and how light is transferred in space. But we're going to be doing some experiments, and I think we, Miss Anna, will be doing one or two that you, we could do at home. I have one that you could try at home. One we can try at home, which is terrific. And um, so really excited about that. Hi, Wes. Nice to see you. So I'm going to turn it over to Miss Anna and we're going to talk about visible light today. So enjoy and um, we know that we can type in the chat if we have questions for Miss Anna and if she doesn't get to your question right away, we'll just be patient and I'll be monitoring that as well. So over to you, Miss Anna. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. I see lots of familiar faces in our participants list here. Um, if you haven't done so already, why don't you go ahead and say something in the chat feature? That way I can make sure I'm seeing everybody's um, comments. You might have to make sure that you're making sure to be messaging me or to all the panelists. That way I'm able to see um, what you are saying in the chat throughout the program, because that's how I'll be able to see all of your answers that you might have to my questions, but that's also how you can ask me questions. And I will make sure to pause a few times to take questions throughout the program, and then we'll save some time at the end to do more questions as well. So today we're talking about visible light. So visible light means we're obviously talking about light that we can actually see, but there are all sorts of light. Now, we might be familiar if you've done a previous session on light or about how light travels through space, you might know that there's all different wavelengths of light, which just means the size of the waves can be very, very different. So we'll go ahead and I'll show you um, some slides here. So today we're talking about visible light, which is just one part of the spectrum of light that exists. So we call this diagram the electromagnetic spectrum. And all these different types of waves are actually light waves. Now, we don't commonly think of things like radio waves as being light, but that's because we just can't see them with our eyes. They are still part of the electromagnetic spectrum, which means that it has both an electric type of wave and a magnetic wave, but that's not super important. What these waves are is they're different sizes which allow us to use them for different things. So way over here, these really, really large waves, those are radio waves. And we might think of radio waves as being something we hear, but we can't actually hear or see radio waves, but they travel to devices that carry sound um, or are able to produce sound like a radio. We also have microwaves, which are a different kind of light wave. We know that we most commonly use those to heat up our food. So the very specific size of these microwaves, a little bit smaller than radio waves, but still pretty large, this size wave actually is able to cause water molecules to vibrate back and forth, back and forth, back and forth very, very quickly, which causes our food to heat up because those vibrating molecules produce a lot of friction, which we can observe as heat. There's also infrared or IR radiation, which we use in order to use remote controls. So you might know that there's a little sensor on the top of your remote controls. If you haven't noticed that before, go ahead and take a look at your remote control later today. All most remote controls that aren't internet enabled carry information through infrared waves, which are even smaller than microwaves. That brings us next to visible light. So visible light is just this one very small section of the electromagnetic spectrum. Only here in this part of the diagram is light waves that we're able to see. So all the colors that humans are able to see um, or are able to perceive as light 
fall in this one very small piece of this diagram. Next, we have ultraviolet waves or ultraviolet light, which we might be familiar with comes from the sun. That's what can actually cause us to get a sunburn if we're not wearing protection from the sun. Um, so always wear protection because we can't see UV light, but it is there, which makes it even more dangerous, right? Because we can't necessarily observe it, but we can observe the effects of UV light, which we can get in a sunburn. Um, and then the smaller we get, um, then we have things like X-rays and gamma rays, which we commonly know as being pretty dangerous. So gamma rays are that dangerous kind of radiation um, that we get in types of power plants or different dangerous types of equipment. Um, X-rays are also pretty dangerous, which is why it's okay to get an X-ray if you have a medical need for one, but we can't get too many X-rays because the size of these waves, just like ultraviolet waves, since they're so small, they can be damaging to the cells inside our body. So all of these different types of waves are actually light waves, but we can only see the ones that fall in the visible light spectrum. When we talk about the size of these waves, we measure them in nanometers. Now, nanometers are very, very small. Does anyone know how many nanometers are in one meter? You should be pretty familiar with a meter. Um, so maybe you've seen a meter stick and you're pretty probably familiar with how far a meter is or even a maybe a kilometer, which is 1,000 meters. Does anyone know how many nanometers are in a meter? Tell me in the chat if you know. Some answers coming in, good answers. So we know it's a lot. Um, Charlotte and Isaiah think a million, that's a great guess. Um, and Owen and Aiden both tell me it's a billion. Um, and then Wes and Emmett tell me it's a trillion. So our numbers are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but we don't need to go much bigger than that. Um, inside one nanometer, there are one billion nanometers. So good job, Owen and Aiden. Good job. There are one billion. That's a one followed by nine zeros. So that's a lot of nanometers in one meter. Um, so these waves are incredibly small. Um, our eyes, the senses or the sensors in our eyes, which we call rods and cones, are only able to see waves that are between 400 to 700 nanometers. So a very, very small range gives us visible light. But this is for the human eye. Other animals can see different wavelengths of light. So if you've ever been curious about what dog vision looks like. We've got a diagram up here. Um, so this is a diagram of what a dog vision might look like if we were able to um, perceive that with our eyes. And we can also see that we've laid out the different color spectrums uh, right here underneath the photo. So the picture on the left, this is human vision. We can perceive all of these colors that we're used to. We perceive you know, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and purple. And so Dogs, though, don't have the red side of the vision, so they're certainly lacking this size wave, these closer to 700 nanometers, but they also lack most of these um, very small light waves, like the purple colors, and everything to dogs is somewhat muted, and that's because dogs don't rely so much on color vision as humans do. Dogs have a lot of other very particular senses, um, so they have a great sense of smell and an incredible sense of hearing, which helps to make up for maybe what they lack in color vision. So dogs can still see um, pretty well. They do have good vision, just not good color vision because they don't have the same range of color vision as humans do. Now, other animals have even different sorts of spectrums. This is the vision or what we imagine the vision of a honeybee might look like. And you can see that bees also lack most of that red um, side of the spectrum that humans have. So we can see lots of shades of red. We can see all the way up to 700 nanometers about. But bees, theirs cuts off a little earlier. Theirs cuts off around 640 or 650 nanometers. So they don't get as much red vision. But what they lack on that side of the spectrum, they more than make up for over here. So 
Does anyone remember that once we got past um, visible light, what was the next type of light that we mentioned on that electromagnetic spectrum? What was a, just a little bit smaller than visible light for humans? What was the next type of light wave? And Isaiah pointed out that bees love purple. They can see purple really, really well, but purple, or what we humans would describe as purple, actually stops right here at 400 nanometers. So that's the limit of human vision. There are no colors that exist past that because if for it to be named a color, right, we have to be able to see it. And so colors all exist on this spectrum. Does anyone remember what type of wave was even smaller than visible light. The name is somewhat of a clue. So if you've pointed out that they've got really good purple vision, it's not quite purple. Is there another name for purple that you might remember? Great job, Owen and Aiden. It is ultraviolet light. So ultraviolet meaning super purple, right? So bees can see beyond purple. They can actually see waves that are even smaller than visible purple light. They can see UV light. That light that comes from the sun and gives us a sunburn is also present on lots of things like flowers, which helps bees to be able to see which types of things they're trying to pollinate. So that's important for bees, right? Flowers have adapted to have different parts of UV markings on them, just like in this far right image. So these are not actually visible colors. So although to us, uh, this diagram is representing them as these really bright blue colors, this is a photo of the flower in UV light. And you can see that there's almost like a target around the flower on the tips of the petal that will help to attract the bees. And then the center of the flower is this nice bright um, color that glows in UV light because bees can actually see that. So they know this is where the pollen is located on a flower so that they can go ahead and grab onto it, help to pollinate other flowers, and help to make honey. So vision is really, really different depending on which species of animal you are talking about. Some animals don't see color at all, um, but humans have a pretty good sense of color vision. Um, so we are gonna talk a little bit more about these different wavelengths of light and how they relate to light that we can see and how we actually create light to use in our home. So our first experiment that we're going to try is putting different spectrum tubes here inside my spectrum casing. Now, if you've ever seen something like this before, this is a plasma globe. And so it's um, a little difficult to see, but we'll get to this one a little bit later on and we'll take a closer look. But if you've seen one of these before, you can see these little tiny, almost looking like lightning strikes inside it. Um, and so that is plasma contained inside the globe. That's what happens when we take electricity and send it through a gas that it ionizes. And we can actually observe that almost like lightning. This plasma globe is full of um, krypton gas, which appears almost like a purple color. And like we said, we'll take a closer look at this in just a few minutes. But first, we're going to take a look at some different spectrum tubes that contain other kinds of gases. Now, we've talked about the periodic table um, a little bit on some of our past episodes. And so every single tube that I have here, here's an example of one spectrum tube. This is a glass tube that only contains one type of gas or one element from our periodic table. So they've actually vacuumed out all the other gases except for the one that we are trying to ionize by sending electricity through the, uh, the tube. So this one is element number one. Does anyone know what element number one on the periodic table is? You know what, tell me in the chat, what is the very first element on the periodic table? Element number one, it has an atomic weight of one. It is hydrogen. Hydrogen is element number one. It only has one proton um, and in its uh, core, in its nucleus. And so it is the most basic element here in our universe. But let's see what happens when we send electricity through hydrogen. Let's see what color we get. You see, we get this very beautiful kind of purple.
Anna, we just lost your sound for some reason. Can everybody, is everybody able to hear Anna or is she still muted for you guys? No, yeah, we lost your sound, Anna. Yep, she'll be trying to fix it, guys. Uh, there she goes. All right, if you can hear me, this one's a little bit choppier. I switched to a different microphone, so I'm sorry if it has a little bit of an echo. This one's not quite as nice as my clip-on one. Um, but if everyone can hear me, we'll just go with this one. It's good. Okay. All right, so we can see that we get this very beautiful pink almost, or it's purple kind of towards the ends, but almost pink right here in the center. Every element that we put inside this spectrum housing will emit different wavelengths of light because of the energy their electrons emit once they get excited by the electricity. But what's really cool about this is we can actually break up this purple light into its individual using this piece of diffraction grating. And can you see those other colors that are emitted? So even though we observe a purplish colored light, you can see that this purplish colored light is actually being made up of blue and red and even just a little bit of yellow so this piece of plastic is called diffraction grating and it splits those um this total frequency of light into all its individual wavelengths that we saw on that electromagnetic spectrum which is pretty cool so let's try another spectrum tube and you can tell me what color you think this one might glow the next one we'll look at is helium uh, so helium has just one more proton and one more electron than hydrogen. It is element number two on our periodic table. We'll go ahead and we'll put helium inside our spectrum housing and tell me in the chat what color do you think helium might emit? Everything's red. Charlotte and Isaiah think maybe green. Owen and Aiden say purple, maybe just like hydrogen since they're pretty similar. This blue. Ooh, good guesses from everybody. All right, let's take a look. This one's very interesting. It's purple over here on the side, but it's actually giving us a very beautiful yellow um, color coming off the center. Now, um, the sun is made up of a lot of hydrogen and helium, um, and the sun is mostly made up of plasma. So this is a good indication if this looks similar to our sun that our sun could contain similar um, elemental composition. Let's take a look at it through this spectrum. And it's a little different than our first one, right? We can see much, much brighter or a thicker yellow band that's being emitted when we split up those individual wavelengths of light. That one is pretty cool. Let's try our next one. I'll let you know the element and you can again guess the color for me. This one is Chlorine. Hmm. So chlorine is an interesting one here. We've got it all ready to go. But tell me, what color do you think chlorine might glow? Green, blue, blue. You can Emmett think red, blue. Lots of guesses for blue. So maybe we've heard chlorine before. Let's take a look. Oh no, I think we shorted this one. All right, you can see it for just a second, but this one does glow blue. There was a note on this one's box that I think someone dropped it, which is okay. Um, we might be able to fix it, just not right now, but I think it might have broken the vacuum inside. But we can see that this one is blue. So we might have guessed blue because we're familiar with the fact that we put chlorine in our pools. Um, and so this chlorine um, does emit a very pretty blue wavelength of light. All right, this next one is also one you've probably heard of before. This is mercury. Mercury is another one of those elements on our periodic table. Mercury is very cool here on Earth because it is actually a metal that exists as a liquid um, at room temperature, which is fascinating. Not many metals exist as a liquid at room temperature. So tell me what color 
Do you think I love how they're guessing red and I wonder why they're guessing red. Maybe someone could put in the chat why you're guessing red. Yeah, so we're, yeah, we'll talk about that. So um, you guys are guessing red and that means you're probably using some of your prior knowledge about mercury. So I told you it exists as a liquid at room temperature. Um, does anyone know what we use liquid mercury for most often? Where do we commonly see? liquid mercury, which exists as a liquid. Yeah, great job, everybody. It's, it's used in thermometers. So if you've ever used a thermometer that um, has that red liquid inside and it rises up as it gets warmer because it's expanding and it sinks down to the bottom as it cools because it's contracting, think about those atoms and molecules. This is used in thermometers. Let's take a look. Look at that. Even though mercury appears red to our eyes at room temperature, when we ionize the gases in mercury, it is not red. Um, so its color when it exists in different states of matter can be totally different. When this gas is ionized, it emits this very bright, beautiful blue wavelength of light. And you can see when we look through our diffraction grating, there are no red wavelengths being emitted. This only contains blue and green, which is very, very beautiful. So maybe not what we expected, right? But that's good. Now we're learning something about how our different elements can appear different in their different states. Uh, Sharon, I say Isaiah want to know if, if mercury is dangerous. Mercury is dangerous. Um, most heavy metals are dangerous, and we don't consider that very often because normally metals exist as a solid, right? So it's really easy to keep them uh, safe and off our skin and out of our mouths or our eyes or things like that. But mercury is a heavy metal, which does make it very dangerous. You would never want to ingest it um, because it is a heavy metal. Good question. All right, we've got two more here, two more. Um, this one is neon. Hmm, think about where you might have seen neon before. Um, you could tell me in the chat, does anyone know what we use neon for pretty often? No, go ahead and tell me in the chat. You can also take a guess at the color if you'd rather guess the color, but if you do know where we use neon, you can tell me in the chat. Well, people not quite sure, but that's okay. You can still guess the color if you'd like to. And I guess it could be yellow. Charlotte and Isaiah say it's used in lights. Gabby says it's used in glow sticks. And I'm not aware that it is used in glow sticks, but we can look that up and find out. Um, but neon is used in lights. And let's take a look at what color it glows. This one is really, really bright red. So maybe this is about the color we were expecting our tube full of mercury to glow because this is kind of similar to that color that we find inside, inside liquid thermometers. Um, but this glows this nice bright orange or red. And let's take a look at those um, different wavelengths through our diffraction grating here. Um, and you can see that it's really emitting almost a pure wavelength of this reddish orange light. There's no other individual bands being emitted. It really is just this color, which is pretty unique and special. All right, we've got one last one here. This one is argon. All right, so our very last one, go ahead and tell me in the chat, um, what color do you think argon might glow? I'm not actually very sure what argon is used for. I know I used to know at least one application, but it's not very common. It's not really used for a lot of things um, other than really what we're using it for right now. And a lot of people guessing Pain. Um, Charlotte guessed, uh, or Lily guessed white. Um, and this one glows a pretty nice purple color. Um, and so this one looks pretty similar to that um, chlorine, or I'm sorry, to the mercury that we looked at, but it has both blue and green bands, but much less on the blue bands. And I'm trying not to get a glare. There we go. Or more blue bands and not so much of that green. It's there very, very faintly in our spectrum or in our diagram here, but um, it's mostly emitting just that bluish light, um, which is very, very beautiful. So good job, everybody. We had lots of great guesses, lots of correct guesses too, which is pretty amazing. Um, so these kinds of gases 
are used pretty commonly in light. So we talked about neon. If you've heard of a neon light before, um, they do use neon because you saw that it glows really, really brightly. But all of these different elements we can put inside neon lights like these ones, and we can actually form the glass into different shapes. And so we can actually um, glass blow or use um, heat in order to shape the glass however we want. And then do the same thing we did to these spectrum tubes. We vacuum out all the air, and then we only put in the type of gas that we want in order to make the light a certain color. So we've got helium, we've got neon that we saw. We also saw argon, which glowed that nice, pretty blue or purplish color. Uh, krypton, um, which we did not see. Um, and xenon, or krypton is what we have inside our plasma globe. Um, that we showed you at first and a little bit of xenon which is why we get kind of a combination of white and purple lightning inside the plasma globe and we'll take a closer look at that um, in just a moment here so that is one way that we can generate visible light at least in different colors but we don't commonly use this type of light bulb in our homes or we don't you know, normally fill it with these kinds of gases right so when we're trying to light up our homes and be able to use that light to do tasks inside right we're really just looking for white light um and so we normally just use regular types of light bulbs and we're going to talk about the differences between light bulbs here so i've got a few examples of different kinds of light bulbs here on my table we'll take a closer look at a few of them um, so we've got few of these. Um, does anyone even know the names of some of these different light bulbs? And I'll pan my camera down just a little further here. Get some of my other supplies out of the way. Um, does anyone know the names of any of these light bulbs? I'll turn them so you can see them all. And if you're familiar with what we might call any of these types of light bulbs, um, the different names that we use for them, go ahead and tell me in the chat. Charlotte and Isaiah know that one of these is an LED light bulb. So you're absolutely right. This one right here is an LED light that stands for light emitting diode. Um, these ones are pretty new, um, but they're pretty awesome. And we'll talk about how these each work in just a moment here. So we have this one is an LED. Do you know what kind of light bulb this is? Um, if you take a close look inside, or if you have a light bulb like this in your house, um, you might notice that there's a tiny little filament inside the glass. The filament is that tiny piece of metal that stretches between the two electrodes where we put in the electricity to this light bulb. This one is called an incandescent bulb, which is uh, kind of an adaptation of the same kind of light bulb that Thomas Edison invented. So if you're familiar with Thomas Edison, he invented this filament style light bulb which now if you buy them at stores, you call them incandescent bulbs. And then these two are actually the same exact type of light bulb. So like we said with our spectrum tubes, glass is really easy to form. And so we can stretch it to be in whichever shape we think might work best. And so these are filled with a gas that works the same way as our plasma tubes. So when we send electricity into the uh, light bulb, it ionizes or um, turns the gas inside into plasma which glows very very brightly so these are the same ones we call these fluorescent bulbs um, or cfls condensed fluorescent light bulbs um, and we can make them whichever shape we want so this one is a bit longer maybe for a different type of light fixture than this one this one might fit in just a regular type of light fixture like a lamp in your room or in your kitchen um, and this one might fit in something more a little bit larger um, but these are both fluorescent light bulbs and they rely on that same principle as our spectrum tubes in order to light up. Now I have a demonstration to show you how this works um, using our plasma glow, but I will need to turn off my light. So I'm going to zoom in just a little bit right over here on our plasma glow. If we turn it on, you can see if I put my hand on here, right, that there is lightning or plasma here inside the globe. We said this is a combination of krypton and xenon gas, which gives it that kind of whitish purple color when we're able to observe it. But of course we can see light much better when the room is a little bit darker. And so I'm gonna go ahead, um, give me just a moment here to hit my lights. 
and I will be right back. This is so cool, and I trust everyone that you uh, have been making all these guesses. You guys have a lot of prior knowledge about light and light bulbs. So this um, is also, you can see it, this is also a fluorescent light bulb. So just like these ones where we stretch the glass in all sorts of crazy shapes, um, this is a fluorescent light bulb that you might see in an overhead light. And so we usually just lay them flat and stick them into the lights in the ceiling. Um, same type of light bulb, this is a glass tube filled with a gas that can be ionized by electricity. Um, and what's really cool about this type of light bulb, right, is that we don't necessarily need to send the electricity through the ends of the light bulb. Of course, that's how we do it in our homes and in our businesses. But watch what happens to this light bulb when I bring it close enough to my plasma globe. Can you see what's happening? Not even touching, if I zoom over here, not touching, but our light bulb is lighting up. This type of light bulb can be powered wirelessly by something like a plasma globe. Of course, we don't want to shoot lightning bolts across our house, and so we don't commonly use plasma balls or Tesla coils, which is the type of device inside there that's generating the plasma. Uh, we don't necessarily want to use them to power up our homes because lightning and plasma can be pretty dangerous when it's not contained in a globe like this. But all we need to do is excite those gases inside. It doesn't take very much energy or very much power in order to do that. Um, so this is a fluorescent light bulb, which are actually the newer options because they're extremely energy efficient. Um, let's take a look next at a different demonstration and talk about how an incandescent light bulb works. So we think back to our incandescent light bulb. It was this one that we said has a filament inside. Now I'm going to leave my lights off for just one more demonstration so we can talk about how a filament works. Now we said that the fluorescent bulb, super energy efficient because it can work wirelessly and it only takes a small amount of electrical energy to excite the gases inside and cause them to glow. We call that fluorescent. But when we excite something like a filament, so when we send electricity through an incandescent light bulb, what we're doing is actually just making that filament inside really, really hot. So hot that it actually starts to burn, which causes the filament to glow very, very brightly. But what's unfortunate about these types of light bulbs is actually they are not energy efficient at all. So we have to put in a lot of energy into this light bulb and it actually wastes about 90% of the electricity that we put inside when it turns that energy into heat. Um, so 90% of the energy we send into this light bulb doesn't even get used, it just gets wasted and burned away. You can think of this just like a combustion reaction. Um, so I'm gonna put on my safety goggles here and we're gonna do a combustion reaction that works very, very similarly. We've seen this one once before, if you've been here for Kaboomistry, our fire program. Um, so what I have is a piece of metal, um, and this piece of metal is shiny and silver, but it's actually made out of magnesium, which is another one of those metals on our periodic table, um, just like mercury, but this one is a solid at room temperature. What makes magnesium very special is it burns very, very brightly, just like the filament in a light bulb. We'll turn on our Bunsen burner here. Got our Bunsen burner going, and we're just going to heat up this magnesium to the point where it starts to glow very, very brightly. And then we'll take a look at the result once it's done burning. So remember that this is simulating an incandescent light bulb filament. Look how bright that burns, but it goes out pretty quickly, right? Um, so we can go ahead and I'm going to flick back on my lights here inside my studio, and then we'll take a look at the results of our experiment. Alright, 
So once we heated up that filament or that piece of metal to the point that it glowed very, very brightly, let's take a look at what's left over. Can you see that kind of ash or debris here inside the bottom of my glass beaker? We kind of destroyed it, right? So as we heated up that piece of magnesium, over time, we also degraded the integrity of it. We started to destroy the filament, which happens in light bulbs too. So over time, this piece of metal gets so hot that it starts to burn and melt. And then eventually one day, that filament is so thin that it'll actually break. And then it's not able to carry current or electricity through the filament anymore, which causes that light bulb to burn out and we can't use it anymore. Um, so we can see that this was a great way for Thomas Edison to invent the light bulb, right? Because that was the kind of equipment that he had access to way back then when he was inventing the incandescent bulb. But we now know that if we use fluorescent light bulbs, we can save ourselves a lot of money on our electricity bill, and those light bulbs will last much longer because there's no filament inside in order to burn out. Um, so I do have a couple of videos that I'd like to share. Um, and we're not gonna, we don't need the sound on these videos. We're just gonna talk a little bit about what's happening in these videos. We're gonna talk about how the difference in energy use between these two types of bulbs. So remember we have an incandescent bulb, which is the filament and a fluorescent bulb, which glows from um, the gases inside starting to light up. Let's take a look at these videos here. All right, so this, device is called a power meter. And can everybody still hear me, Molly and Katie? Can you hear me? It's all good. This is all right, awesome. Just, just making sure. All right, so this device down here, this is a power meter. And you probably have one of these attached to the side of your house. Sometimes they're digital now. And so they might not have this crank that we're going to look at. But what happens is when you're using electricity in your house, this crank starts to spin around and around and around, telling you how much electricity you are using. So we've got four devices here. We've got an incandescent bulb, which is the blue one. We have a radio, a hair dryer, and a fluorescent bulb way over here on the left. So let's take a look at how much power each of these devices uses. So remember that we're looking for the speed at which the dial is starting to turn when we turn on these devices. So this is the incandescent bulb. And if you see those little blue dots, you can just see um, about how fast the dial is spinning. And now let's compare that to the radio next. And let's take a look at how much power a radio might use. Oh, this might be just the light bulb comparison. It is just the light bulb comparison. But we'll, we'll do the other one next. All right, so this is the fluorescent bulb. We said these are a little bit more energy efficient. And if you take a look at those blue dots, they're turning much more slowly, which tells us that we are using way less electricity in order to get that light bulb to light up. We pay for every single turn that electric power meter goes through. Um, so let's exit out of this. And let's take a look at some of the other devices just so that we can be aware of what kind of and how much power we are using. Um, so we've got, again, the first one is that incandescent bulb and it takes a lot of power. It really turns that dial around pretty quickly and we pay for every turn of the dial on our energy bill at the end of the month. This is the radio. Um, so not very much power going to a radio. It really doesn't take much power in order to work. Um, the hair dryer, though, let's take a look at the hair dryer. Look at the meter go. So this is why we don't want to use our hair dryer for too long. Um, maybe let your hair dry a little bit first if you have a hair dryer because that meter was spinning so fast we couldn't even see those blue dots. And then again, this is that fluorescent bulb turning pretty slowly. Um, so it's not using as much power as our incandescent bulb. Um, so that's incandescent versus fluorescent. And then we said even newer are these things called light emitting diodes. These are the most energy efficient types of light bulbs that you could use in your house. If the incandescent light bulb took 50 watts of power, 
in order to turn on, our fluorescent light bulb would take about 12 uh, watts of power, and the light emitting diode would take only about four and a half watts of power. So less than 10% of the energy can go to this LED, and they actually glow much more brightly than the incandescent bulb. So you or your parents are trying to save money on your energy bill, one of the easiest things you can do is change your light bulb because you'll save energy. And so even though it might cost you a small amount to get these newer costs or newer types of bulbs, they'll last way longer than incandescents and they'll use less power. So in the long run, they'll save you tons of money. And I know that my power company actually came in and a couple years ago in my apartment, they actually changed out all my light bulbs for free because they wanted people to use less power and to be able to save energy. So look into that. I know those programs don't exist everywhere, but you should certainly look into it or contact your power company and see if they would offer you a deal um, on changing out your light bulb so that you can be more energy efficient because the less energy we use, right, the less fossil fuels we need to burn and the better health for our planet too. So all really important things to consider. Now we have one last experiment to try here on our, in our program, and we're actually going to try to create our own incandescent light bulb. This is an activity that you could recreate at home, but it's very important that you follow some very specific safety instructions. Um, we said this is an incandescent bulb, something with a filament. So we know that this filament is going to have to get extremely hot in order to glow. Um, so we'll be doing that using some different household materials, things that you might have at home. And so you could reasonably recreate this, but of course, anytime we're working with something dangerous like electricity or fire or heat, we need to be very, very safe, safety first always, and get maybe an adult to help us with some of these experiments. Um, it's always good to have an adult's help because they're very, very helpful. They have lots of use or know-how of tools, um, but also they might know how to do this um, very safely and have some good safety suggestions for you. All right, so let's take a look at some of my um, household materials. I'm a little blurry here, there it goes. Let's take a zoomed in look. So for the setup of my light bulb, I've taken a Dixie cup um, just a paper cup for um, just your bathroom and I've cut it in half so it's a little bit shorter and then what I've done is I have um, attached or taped some alligator clips. Now you don't necessarily have to use alligator clips for this, they do make it a little easier, um, but you could use any sort of current carrying wire that you might have around your house. Um, so I've taped them to the side and what those are going to do is they're actually going to hold my filament. We said that metals usually are used inside incandescent light bulbs as filaments. We saw a magnesium burn. We saw in our incandescent bulb, right? There's a very, very small, thin filament stretched between those two electrodes. And that will glow really, really brightly once we send electricity through our wires. Um, what I've also done is I've taped together eight D cell batteries here. So I've taped them all together. Um, each D cell battery gives us about one and a half volts of power. And so at the end of it, right, we've got um, a little bit of loss as it goes through the batteries. But at the end, I measured this, we ended up with about seven and a half or eight volts of power coming from this whole stack of batteries. So this will be our power supply. We're going to attach it using our alligator clips. So I'm just going to, let me zoom out so you can see what I'm going to do exactly. Um, I'm just going to take our alligator clips or our current carrying wire and attach it to both ends of our battery here. And then we just need our filament is the last thing we need. And so um, to make it look like a light bulb, I also have this uh, mason jar, which I'm going to place over the top, um, which will kind of keep everything safe and inside. But to act as our filament, I'm actually going to use something pretty simple. I'm going to use pencil lead. So if you have a mechanical pencil at home, um, all you need to do is take just one piece of that pencil lead out. They're very, very delicate, but these are made out of graphite. Um, so graphite is uh, a metal. Um, so there is metal inside this filament here, and it's very, very thin, which is good for this experiment. You need to use something very, very thin that's also able to carry an electric current. 
Hold this very carefully. Slip it between our two electrodes, trying not to break it when we do that. Um, we'll go ahead and I'll put my glass lid over the top. I might need to make my filament just a little shorter if I got just a tiny piece there. Place our lid over the top, and then we're going to attach our electrodes to our power source. And then let's take a look at what happens. See that? The light bulb is working, right? Light bulbs are not that complicated. Thomas Edison did lots of the work for us and told us that all we need is current flowing through a very, very thin piece of metal, which gets so hot that it glows very, very brightly. But unfortunately, this reaction won't last forever. You can see a small amount of smoke is being generated there inside the jar. So again, since this is creating fire and a good amount of heat, we need to be careful. Always do this somewhere safe where it's not going to fall over, where nothing's going to bump it since that filament is extremely, extremely hot. Um, but we can take a look. Let's see if we can, I'll take my glass off here. And we'll try it one last time, but we're getting about to the end of the lifespan of this filament. You can't see it very well when it's not glowing, but it's really, really thin and brittle and looks like it's about to break. And so um, our filament, again, like we said, is not going to last forever, there it goes. Um, it actually just broke apart. Let's see if we can try to get a good look at that. Might help if I stand behind it. But can you guys see? Oh man, it doesn't want to focus on the filament. There it is. There's now a gap right here um, between our pencil lead, and it's just complete. It's so thin that now there's no point of contact. So we've stopped the flow of electricity through our circuit. Um, we burnt it out. And this mimics what happens inside your light bulbs at home, right? If we continue to use these incandescent bulbs, they have a shelf life or they have a lifespan that they have um, for that filament. It really doesn't last forever. It's not a perfect system. Fluorescent light bulbs don't last forever either. Eventually those gases inside um, will run out or will break down, but their lifespan is much longer than the tiny delicate piece of metal stretched between the electrodes in these incandescent bulbs. All right, so that is about all I've got for us today. Um, I'd love to answer any questions that you might have. So if you have questions about any of our experiments or about how you might be able to recreate this experiment at home, which is really the only one that I recommend with parental supervision, uh, we can talk about that a little bit more. See that Charlotte and Isaiah said that your mom wants to switch out all your old light bulbs, and that's awesome. I'm so glad that you guys are thinking about that because it's important. It will save you money, but it will also save the earth, which is even more important in the long run. So that's so awesome. I'm so glad to hear that. Um, I that was absolutely phenomenal, um, Miss Anna. So boys and girls, if you have any questions. Just put them in the chat, but I just would like to know, is that experiment written up um, that we can put it on our website? I can get, I don't have it finalized, but I can get that to you probably by the end of the day or maybe this evening. And so I will have that sent over when you guys publish some resources, maybe a little bit later this week. Perfect. Okay. And Charlotte and Isaiah would like to, um, what light in the old light? Question. So there's really no such thing as cool light. It's just the way we describe it. So if we think about our spectrum. Did you hear that question, Anna? I did. I did. Warm and cool light. And so there is really no such thing as cool light in light bulbs. Um, because like we said, no matter what, we're either ionizing a gas, which takes energy, or we're burning a filament, which is very, very hot. But what they mean by that is the type of color that it emits. So we, commonly we think of warmer colors as colors that are more yellow and a little bit softer, but cool light looks a little bit more on the blue side. And there's actually studies that tell us that different types of light, so warm or cool light, can either help us to focus better or are better to be used in our bedrooms because cool light can be a little bit, make it a little bit harder for people to fall asleep because those wavelengths of light just get your brain really, really active. Whereas warm lights are a little bit more relaxing and soothing. And so you might not want to use those in places like your office, because if you feel very relaxed and very soothed, right, you might not do very good work or work very fast. Um, so there are different benefits to using a warm or a cool colored light bulb. 
but it has nothing to do with the temperature. Awesome. Any other questions, guys? No, I think they're great, but I loved how they uh, were using what they'd learned in other sessions and inspired um, all the questions that you asked. And um, yeah, we're really looking forward to our next session next. Yes. Yeah, so we're going to talk about the vacuum. Oh, of I to know what wavelength is fire? That's a really great question. Great question. Fire is not a wavelength of light. Remember, so combustion is a chemical reaction that produces heat, light, and smoke. So it depends on what you burn, right? Just like in our spectrum tube, different elements gave us different colors of light or wavelengths of light that we can perceive with our eyes. So it really depends on what you burn. Um, so if you've ever seen experiments, um, if you joined for Kaboomistry, we've done some experiments where we burn different metals. And when those different metals burn, they emit different wavelengths of light. So we saw that some metals will burn green, or others will burn red or pink. Um, so it really depends on what you are using in your combustion reaction. Great question. And how does sunscreen block ultraviolet light? a very good question. So yeah. it has a different chemical composition than the surface of your skin. And so it allows, it absorbs actually that UV light. So the molecules inside are designed in order to absorb it so that it can't pass through your layer of sunscreen in order to get to the cells inside your skin. Um, we use different amounts of that chemical, which gives us different SPFs or sun protection factors. So you should always use a strong SPF because that's blocking most of the UV light from your skin because a little bit of UV light is good for your body. It helps you produce vitamin D, but a lot of it is very, very damaging to our cells. Oh, I, I like this question uh, from Charlotte and Isaiah. My mom says we shouldn't stand- And is it true you only world. need to use sunscreen in the summer? or do you need to wear sunscreen? That's a great question. So the sun still comes out in the winter time, right? And since we have so much moisture in the air in the clouds, it's actually just as important, if not more important, to wear sunscreen in the winter time, which doesn't sound like it makes a lot of sense, but we don't normally wear it because we're usually wearing clothing and hats and gloves and we're wearing clothing that protects us from the sun. But if you're going to be outside in the winter time, or even when it's cloudy, you still should be wearing sunblock if your skin is exposed because the clouds can actually amplify the UV light. They can make it more powerful. So we say that it's actually easier to get a sunburn on a cloudy day than on a sunny day, which doesn't sound like it makes a lot of sense, but the UV light, remember, is still there, even though we can't see it with our eyes because it is not visible light. And I did hear Katie's question too, um, which came from Charlotte and Isaiah about standing in front of the microwave. Um, that's a good question, but that is actually a myth. Um, old microwaves didn't have a lot of casings or protection around them um, to keep people safe from outside them. But now we design uh, microwaves in such a way that there's a layer of metal the whole way around. Even if you can see through it, there's still a very thin metal mesh screen um, inside the glass that keeps the microwaves inside. So you are okay to stand by the microwave. Um, I've heard that some people can be sensitive to the sound that it makes, so it can give you headaches, um, but it's not dangerous to your cells because all of those waves are trapped inside the microwave and are not able to escape. And Rayel just wanted you to know that in a Callowit, in the winter time, the sun goes down like three in the afternoon. It's really- yeah, so that's one of the reasons we don't think about wearing sunblock in the winter time, right? Is that there's such a limited amount or time of sunlight that we get that we don't really think about needing it. Um, and we don't go outside with no uh, sleeves on in the winter time either. But I've gotten a sunburn in the winter time on my cheeks before. And so it's just something you can think about. And the older you get, the more you'll realize that sunscreen is super important if you want your skin to stay beautiful and healthy um, and not get any sort of spot. 
So on, thank you so much again, Miss Anna. We love our sessions on Wednesdays, uh, Wednesday morning with you, and we have um, such a great class. So boys and girls, I hope you come back soon to meet Charles Ingalls, a uh, pioneer um, uh, in a few minutes, and we will see you soon. And thanks, Miss Anna. We'll see you next week. Awesome. Bye, everybody.